engage your brain and enter the mind's eye. I'm your host, Brian Turnoff, and you're listening to Z Talk Radio. Let me just hit the social media slopes real quick. Don't forget to check out our barely month old Twitter account, at Mind's Eye Show. Uh, it's like a little baby still growing before our, our eyes. And it has everything you want, everything you need, at Mind's Eye Show. We're coming to the conclusion of what turned into an unexpected trilogy on the ancient Egyptian culture. Two weeks ago, we spoke with Robert Boval, acclaimed discoverer of the Orion Correlation Theory about the mysteries of the Great Pyramid. Last week, we discussed with Jean-Louis de Biasi about the historical evidence that, Egypt, that links the Egyptians with some of the origins of today's secret societies. And on this very special edition, we have a first, an exclusive, the first ever American media interview with Dominic Gorlitz. He is a bit of a controversial figure caught up in a scandal in Egypt. In fact, what we're talking about tonight actually still has people's lives in the balance. Dominic is going to talk about his exploration of the Great Pyramid and his findings and analysis. And what he talks about is quite stunning and a revelation in all of the sense of the word. Oh, and that absolutely lovely music you're listening to is the music for the Kiops project, which Dominic is going to talk about, which he was involved with. So when we come back to the break with Dominic Gorlitz, we're getting into the mysteries, the scandals of the Great Pyramid. So get ready, hold on to your seats, get whatever you need. It's going to be a long and bumpy ride on a special edition, nearly two hours with Dominic Gorlitz. We're back on the Mind's Eye Show and joined by our very special guest, Dominic Gorlitz. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Yes, thanks also, and greetings to all Americans from Germany. <laughs> uh, and you're uh, quite the controversial figure these days, Dominic, and I hope whatever we say tonight uh, won't really implicate you further or uh, anything will be held against you in a, in a court of law. Yes, let's cross fingers and pray to whomever that at the end everything will end nice. <laughs> let's let's pr pray to the justice gods because hopefully you'll, you'll really get some. Uh, and that's really what the point of this show is tonight. And this is really a, a first for the American media and apparently... We just talked about a little surprise, which you heard early in the show, and we'll explain that earlier. And much of the mainstream media has has written you off and 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 really called you some unflattering names. But like I just said, you're going to get a fair shake on this show. Tell a little bit. You know, clearly you're not a crazy guy. Uh, you're not a vandal off the street. Share the listener a little bit about your educational background and and some of your professional qualifications. Yes, uh, again, my name is uh, Dominic Gerlitz. I am a PhD doctor. I'm, do, uh, I'm doing research since about 20 years in the field of experimental archaeology. So I'm a little bit proud to say that I deal a lot with uh, the famous uh, Norwegian explorer Thor Heyerdahl, who has already uh, opened and completely new window about the maritime capabilities of the ancients and in the wake of two higher dollars, I did three large reboot expeditions, one even across the North Atlantic, starting from New York, with the heading to the old world in the opposite direction. And this brings me direct to my daily work. Also for me, my Abora projects address uh, the key questions to uh, very high relevance to our society today, because the future is complex, dynamic, and uncertain. And for me, it's the main questions how does our society deal with these challenges? And this is what many people do not understand right. We can derive so much answers from the events of antiquity. 
and our key cope with complexity and impending fundamental changes lies not in the perturbation and acceleration of those existing processes or structures. We have to break away from these patterns and only those societies who embrace new ways of thinking will achieve new and sustainable growth. Everything else is living in the own bubble of self-deception and it will end like the Egyptians. <laughs> I'm, I'm in complete agreement with you and you, you touched on the Abora project and the, uh, the Abora missions and when you sent me the links to them, uh, I took a look at them and, and they're quite intense. Uh, so you talked about it a little bit, but you didn't really talk about how hardcore it is, uh, in, in so to speak. And I, I definitely recommend our listeners, because uh, it's up on YouTube, I believe, uh, to check it out and really talk about, you know, the goal of that was essentially, would you say, to kind of like disprove, uh, to disprove that, or maybe to, to say that we really underestimate the knowledge of the antiquities and, and the ancient civilizations. Yes, um, I'm working about 30 years on the subject how the early man could uh, go back and forth across the ocean. When to Heyerdahl set sail the first time with Kotiki, it was in 1946 and 47, and also in his later projects, he only could go downwind only from A to B, in order to demonstrate how ancient societies could spread their knowledge from one point, let's say it in simple words, across the, across the ocean to the world. But this is not in accordance to modern archaeology, because in modern archaeology we are asking different questions, as to Heidel did 60, 70 years ago. Uh, and when we are speaking today about man's capabilities to cross the ocean, we also have to speak back and forth uh, voyages because we need to understand how ancient societies could communicate, could trade to each other. And I did my PhD in the last 12 years on several universities about the spread of ancient plants. And, I, and to go a little bit deeper in detail, I did my PhD about the enigmatic tobacco findings in ancient Egyptian mummies. Uh, this was found by Dr. Svetlana Balabanova in the end of the 90s of last century. Uh, Dr. Betlana, uh, Svetlana Balabanova was one of my doctor fathers, so to say, and she supported. She has supported me in doing my research on several universities, and she found over 3,000 evidence. Again, not three, not 300, 3,000 yeah, evidence big difference. <laughs> for the use of tobacco in Egypt, in Egyptian mummies. How in the world is this possible? Uh, and one major aspect, one major goal of my PhD was to investigate are there different possible explanations, maybe relict endemits in Africa or Asia, or how could birds or natural currents spread these genes from one side of the ocean to the other? And after a 12 years long study with several institutes, with doing plant genetical work, etc., etc., I was able to demonstrate that it is 10 times more likely that the ancient man has spread these genes across the ocean instead of natural effects. Mm. And that, that is why it was so important to sail with Abora 3 in 2007, starting from New York with the heading to Spain in order to demonstrate how Stone Age seafarers were able to follow the Gulf Stream in the opposite direction. And not many people really understood what was the meaning of Abora 3, because the major opinion is in, uh, in oceanography, in archaeology, history of navigation, etc., that it was in fact impossible to go the opposite way uh, based on the difficulties of the Gulf Stream because the Gulf Stream is a meandering warm water belt, which is completely different with the equatorial current, which Toheada used with Ra1 and Ra2 in 1970, for instance. Yeah. And the Gulf Stream is accompanied on its edges on huge water swirls, as big as Germany. And these water swirls called eddies turn in the opposite direction of the Gulf Stream 
and this means every piece of wood or reed raft or coconut, whatever comes in mm-hmm. such a eddy, will be transported back to America. And it was the scholar's opinion, based on this difficult uh, current patterns, that it is in fact impossible to uh, return with an ancient raft back to the old world, as to Heyerdahl has already predicted 60 years ago. Yeah. And we did. A- absolutely fascinating, and, and essentially what you're saying is that you can, we can now prove, or we're on the cups, you're on the cusp of proving, I don't want to say we, because uh, I'm not doing anything, <laughs> uh, of proving that it was not easy, but it was permittable to actually have a spread of information, uh, like you said, plants, horticulture, of that nature, and, and we can see that uh, um, that is one evidence that ancient cultures or at least cultures were actually allowed, they can just be in contact and, and talk to each other. And, and I've always found interesting, part of that is that um, why there are always pyramids, you can always see pyramids in different cultures that, like you said, were supposedly never in contact with each other. Uh, do you think there's a relationship with the pyramids, with that idea? As a being frank, when I started my first investigation, I was totally convinced this is a, one of the strongest scientific proofs that such ancient interactions have, uh, has, have existed. Mm-hmm. But being frank, we have to be very carefully in, in pushing too much this architectural evidence. It's for sure, and I will tell you something. When we landed in 2007, Shortly, in, uh, when, uh, so Abora 3 did not achieve its geographical goal due to a, a number of modern mistakes, failures. We couldn't achieve our geographical goal, but we were able to cover at least 2,400 miles along the Gulf Stream. And after 13 storm, the raft had to be abandoned and we, we set over with a modern yacht. But when we landed in on the ASOS, it was in 2007, and on the next morning I opened the hotel window, I saw a vulcan on the upper side of my hotel. Mm-hmm. This was the island Pico in, on the ASOS. And when I saw this vulcan, I, I knew immediately, listen, on the other side, it looks identical as the vulcan uh, Etna on Sicily. And personal with to Heyerdahl and some other pyramid researcher, I visited Sicily two times, the Vulcan Etna is surrounded by at least 500, maybe even 1,000 step pyramids, similar to the Canary Islands, similar to the pyramids on Corsica or Sardinia. And when I saw this Vulcan on the ASOS, I knew immediately in my heart, there must be pyramids, it's identical. And I can tell you why, because the Stone Age navigators looked for obsidian. It's a typical Vulcan stone. And this was the iron of the Stone Age. Nothing else is, has the same. As I said, it's, it's, it has the same. Oh my goodness, my English. It has the same. Um, give me one second to Google this word. Uh, <laughs> sorry, my English is not. Oh perfect, no, please! But... Your uh, English is is probably much better than my German, to say the no, least. No, no, it, it's it's hardness. Also, the hardness of obsidian. Ah yes, the hardness, right? It's it's. Uh, uh, Obsidian is volcanic glass, and the hardness is even harder than iron. And this was what the so navigators watch for. That's why we find pyramids on Sardinia, on Sicily, on the volcano of the Canary Islands. I'm speaking about uh, the volcano Tide, Tenerife. Hmm. Yeah, to higher uh, has passed his uh, has uh, lived on his last ten years here. Yeah? And this cannot be a coincidence that we have on all these volcanic islands, either in the Mediterranean or even in the eastern and central Atlantic Ocean pyramids. And this is what a Portuguese archaeologist found in 2012 and 2013, exactly on the place where I believe there must be pyramids. Two, three years later, a Portuguese uh, scientist found over 140 stepped pyramids in the middle of nowhere. On the ASOS. Wow. And how can this be possible? The only logical explanation is that the ancient societies, I'm speaking about the Greek society, I'm speaking about the uh, society from Crete, these people had a clear knowledge about the 
lens beyond the Strait of Gibraltar. Yeah. And today I'm doing a large research program with the University of Dresden and the University of Budapest and the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., on which we are going to reference ancient maps from the ancient societies with modern maps. And what I can tell you, when you go back to the ancient written records to Eratosthenes or to Diodor from Sicily, they have a scientific knowledge of the existence of America. There cannot be any doubt. Yeah, I was just about to say that, uh, didn't I think in recent news that uh, a map from China uh, that's uh, maybe I think at least 1,200 years off, I don't really know the amount off, off the top of my head, that you know, I had a, a map, a geographic map of America. So uh, that definitely goes along with what you're saying. I, I couldn't agree more. That's really fascinating. When when does that project, are you in the middle of that project or is that about to start, the map one? Uh, we are launching it. I, I visited, I have already visited two times the Library of Congress and we, have, we could inspire with enthusiasm very strong American geographers and supporting us. And that's such a fascinating subject, speaking about this ancient maps pro map project. If you go back to maps like the Peter Reis map from a Turkish admiral, mm -hmm. he is saying, I made this map based on 20 antique maps. He even gave this wow. antique maps names. Huh. It's finding like an ancient videotape in which one scientist is uh, telling us about the ancient knowledge and this is this directly um, is pointing to the Cheops project what we did in 2013. We are completely underestimating early man capability in architecture, geography, astronomy and, and of course also about ancient navigation. Oh, yes and, and I think for you know there's a lot of people that I talk to now that that really seem to be on our side because I'll admit I, I do believe that uh, just as much as it seems that that you do uh, but you know for whatever reason you know it, it in the textbook it, it still hasn't changed we can see uh, that there's so much evidence that that points to that and most of the people I talk to agree but for whatever reason the history books have, haven't quite been changed just yet they'll, they'll catch up and I'm glad you, obviously you brought up what you're really here to talk about the uh, the Keops project and let, let's talk about that you've been Obviously, this must be somewhat of a, a bit of a stressful time with you because we talked earlier how you have some charges against you. Let's let's go to the beginning of that. Talk about the the Keops project and and how that research started. Let me be brief. I need to start ten years earlier because Please do. after my first successful project with Tohayadal and the archaeological professor from the University of Bologna, Professor Valerio Manfredi, a very good friend of Tohayadal in, in those days, we had the idea, let's excavate one of these numberless pyramids on the island of Sic uh, Sicily, mm -hmm. in the center of the Mediterranean. Right, we were just talking about. And we got a, a, a huge punch, punch from the archaeological department because they refused us to give us a, a, a digging license. Mm -hmm. And this was the day um, zero for me to step out of this uh, pyramids because as soon as you began to investigate pyramids, you become a pyramid idiot. <laughs> See, experts. And that's why I decided to step out of pyramids. It's totally, totally helpless, senseless to deal with pyramids in order to prove diffusionism as a cultural diffusion and cultural exchange across the ocean. This was, for me, this was in 1999, and I, I put my whole libraries with all the books about pyramids to the garbage. Forget wow. about this. Un impossible. <laughs> After my success with Abora 3, at least in the media, I got uh, many offers to, to do exhibitions, and I did. One large exhibition was in 2012 in the Traffic Museum in the city of Dresden. And there I got an, so it was very, very successful. We have broken all records of visitors in the last 30 years with our display. And it was in December 2012. I got an email from a guy. I, I knew him before by some books, but I never met him personally. His name was Stefan Erdmann. He hmm. was a private researcher. He even lived like your eight years in front of the pyramids. He has worked there over 25 years. And this was remarkable. He did some private research in 2006 and 2007 inside the pyramid 
uh, inside of the Cheops Pyramid, and he explained me in, in December 2012, listen Dominic, I discovered something remarkable on the ceiling of the King's Chamber in the Pyramid. What's your opinion about this? You are an, you are an experienced experimental archaeologist. Could this be something important? And I said, you are kidding me? You are a private person? You do excavations? You take samples <laughs> and everything? Is this be okay? Of course. Said, yes. <laughs> I always had a permit. I always was accompanied with Egyptologists and security people from the Supreme Consulate of Antiquity. I never got any criticism or punishment, nothing. It's totally legal what I'm doing and I would like to invite you to come with me to Egypt to do some new inspiring research. And I said, oh, yeah, that's an saying? understatement. <laughs> I have to check your evidence and of course I need to check your permits and to speak with your uh, cooperating institution in Germany which has done all these investigations in the last 10 years. I don't know if you are familiar with Stefan Erdmann. Uh, I, I, only from really doing the research uh, with the interview, interview with you, and uh, obviously you just you just talked about a, a lot of the credentials that that he has. And when you did this project, so so you decided to to obviously do this project. You go to Egypt. You realized you had all the permits uh, to do all this project, right? Uh, well, yes. Um, let's start again from the beginning. Stefan showed me pictures from his investigation campaign, uh, campaign between, uh, between 2006 and 2007. And one picture showed me the large granite blocks in the King's Chamber. I know what you're sp I'm speaking about. Yes. This 130 but... huge granite blocks. One block has a weight between 40 to 7 tons at least. And, and this is, uh, for the listener that's not familiar, that's inside the, the Great Pyramid. Uh, there's two parts called the King's and Queen's Chamber. You're talking about the King's Chamber right now, right? Yes, and what he showed me was in fact astonishing. Because um, what he showed me were, were pictures. You could see nine of these beams covering this chamber. Mm -hmm. And each of these nine beams had on the opposite side part of the beam, two plaque areas, identical, let me say, symmetrical in shape and size. And when I saw these pictures, I immediately asked Stefan, Stefan, did you not ask an Egyptologist about the meaning? Why you are asking me? I'm not an Egyptologist. And he said, yes, I did. I was, in 2007, I met with a doctor of Egyptology from the University of Cairo. I showed him this uh, picture evidence. And he said to me, ah, Stefan, don't invest. Don't waste your money and your time. It has no meaning. Forget about this. This is just, I don't want to say it's a bad word, bullshit. Forget that. <laughs> It has no importance for Egyptology at all. Well, Don't waste your money. And I'm just wondering, how. that's a pretty bold statement for you know, probably a, whatever, whoever he spoke to was a, a respected Egyptologist. What would that, you know, we're seeing something different or something interesting about a really mysterious, fascinating area in the Great Pyramid. How can that person just say that that's a waste of time and that's nothing? What is, what is that based on? How can they confidently say that? What shall I tell you? Also, I can tell you, I met many, many Egyptologists and I don't want to break a wood above their head. I had so much support when I did my PhD by at least uh, two German Egyptologists. I'm a very good friend of Sarah Shepard, David Wall from England, and I cannot criticize all Egyptologists. No, we're not going to generalize. We don't want to generalize at all, of but, course. But we have, exactly, but we have to speak about science in the 21st century. This is our the subject. And when we are speaking about science in the 21st sub uh, century, we don't have a, a, a gap in the perception of modern science. I think our science is quite well established, but our problem is we don't have a, a, a we, we have a problem in the implementation of the results of modern science. This is our real problem. And so we have to turn the discussion in the other direction. The question is not if this was a well-educated Egyptologist or not. When I saw these pictures from Stefan, being a well-practiced, well-educated experimental archaeologist, I did understood immediately, 
you are kidding me? Nine, 18 black areas hmm. symmetrically spread above nine huge granite blocks. This must have had a technical meaning. There couldn't, there couldn't be any doubt. And so this was for me my personal motivation why I said, yes, let's check your permit. I, I, I demanded from Stefan, please, I need to have this uh, permit in advance. I need to check it. I have spoken with the head of his uh, institution where he has done over the last 10 years his private research, so to say. And what I got was always the same. Nobody can swear you it is okay or not. But in accordance to what we did, at least in the last 10 years, we never got any complaint. We never got any critics. Always Stefan was able to present a permit. Always Stefan was able to present. He did this sample takings when he was uh, advised by at least one or even four inspectors of the Supreme Consulate of Antiquity. And this finally convinced me after a certain period of thinking, yes, no, yes, no, ah, let's take the risk because uh, modern science needs to push the limits. And that's why I said, yes, maybe the, as I, I was convinced by Stefan, it is okay because we got a permit I sent the permit to a friend, he's uh, fluently speaking Arabic, he translated this permit, he said, I cannot see any concerns, any danger, yes, it's written there nothing about the purpose of the permit, it is written nothing about your names, what is denied it, what is refused or not, it just was a permit, as Stefan told me, when we arrived at the permit, it was exactly as Stefan did predict it to me, uh, as he has predicted, we were uh, uh, two tourist police men has welcomed us on the gate. Together we have drove with the car to the permit. There he handed us over in the hands of two inspectors, mainly Egyptologists, which do this work as inspectors uh, in the behalf of the Supreme Consulate. Uh, by sides their official profession to get a little bit of uh, additional money. And I have to tell you, we met one of these inspectors in the morning when we became recommended by Stefan's tour operator. You have to visit the bird's tomb, a natural cave system which goes under the beneath of the uh, Scheffel pyramid. Hmm. It's about 500 meters away from the Kerbs pyramid. We did this challenge. It was not very exciting. I have, I have to cut the long story short, but so I met first time the leading inspector who was also an inspector in the evening operation. And what shall I say? In advance, Stefan asked the tour operator, please provide us letters for the investigation. And this is really astonishing. Stefan even met this inspector four days before I came to Egypt in order to prepare everything carefully. He showed the inspector on his computer screen what he did in 2006 and 2007, how he worked together with other Egyptologists to climb in the uh, relief chambers and how he got his samples there, up and down, trick and track, everywhere, what he brought out to the country. And this inspector was, was full introduced in what has happened in April 2013. Yes. And when we came to the King's Chamber in April, yes, we found the two letters, what we ordered before in advance, everything was there. The tourist police handed these letters over to the two inspectors, and together we walked very, it was totally in a very friendly manner, nothing was in hurry, everything was fine. We, we entered the King's Chamber, the two inspectors put the letters together, and I can tell you this was quite risky because the material what they used was very old and rotten. The ropes were terrifically bad and I, I assisted them a little bit with my experiences of making ancient redrafts, how to put these two letters safely together <laughs> because you have, to, you have to pay attention. This chamber is about six meters high. One letter was not enough to come to the ceiling. 
So okay, so obviously you, you came. You're, you're you're starting to do your work. Everything you were led into the king's chamber. All the permits checked out. Uh, everything was there. You're you're finally in the king's chamber. Uh, and like any good scientist, you're following the scientific method. You would probably make a hypothesis of what you think that material that you're about to look at, uh, about to analyze is. What before you actually did the research itself. Uh, what did you actually think that black uh, markings were? Now, this is a, a very special question because uh, from these pictures, from the first pictures, what uh, Stefan delivered to me, you could it could be everything. What do you so mean by that? Tortures, old boards which were erected there to fix something. Mm. It could be new, old. I have, being frank, I had no special initial hypothesis of course i asked some uh, egyptologists friends from italy friends from germany what might it be an organic substance an organic patina and i ask an expert of restoration in italy and the university of Milan, and nobody could really guess what it is because it the pictures and their resolution were too rough to say anything and what i learned being in reader of Arthur Conan Doyle from Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson is <laughs> the best thing in science is having no hypothesis because as soon as you are creating this, an hypothesis you have a bias. without having facts you have the danger to put the facts to the theories instead of putting the theories to the little facts and so it was better not to have any hypothesis uh, and so I went to Egypt uh, without a special theory what might be the nature of this black patina. Uh, of course, we did our very best to prepare it as best as possible, especially not to harm this building. Of and course. That is why I got several advices, 100 recommendations, how to get this substance from this granite wall. So, so tell us actually about that process. You're, you're on top of the ladder. You're inside the king's chamber. Uh, you're finally about to start, and you're... Uh, let me, or now you're finally about to start. You're started. Tell, uh, oh, what were you saying? I apologize. Still, let me say still something about our preparations, because... Please do. I interviewed three very famous experts in Europe. Mm -hmm. How could I get samples from an unknown patina about nobody knows what the, real, the nature of this material is? And uh, the majority recommendation was... Yes, you have to use alcoholic liquids, which will, which are very strong and can solve from stone, even inside from the stone, some material. And this was our main, let's say, approach. Okay, we were prepared, we prepared with several uh, different liquids of alcoholic substances and cotton. I have to say this cotton. Yes, little cotton balls to solve in a time of five to ten minutes from the ceiling, this material in this cotton pads. Is this right? Is that in English? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Cotton pads, right. <laughs> yeah. And and this was very, um, to say this in English, this was a little bit confusing when the Egyptologist put the letters for me. And I walked up and I opened the headlight, headlight I was totally impressed. Oh my goodness, this would never be what I have expected before. Because when I opened my light and I had also a hand light, I saw, oh my goodness, this is completely out of any thinking what you could believe before about the fourth hmm. dynasty, what I saw there. And based on my education of a PhD biologist and in, in my side profession is also a geography and geography I could I knew immediately what I saw there when I came down the inspector asked me yeah, what you are finally doing I said yes listen Garbo we want to investigate this black areas on the ceiling and yes and all the investigation material was in front of us also the two inspectors could have access what's going on there what is going on there and uh, in accordance to our first idea, 
to solve this uh, patina with alcoholic liquid on this uh, cotton pads, uh, I put this theory in the garbage as it, you, and I can tell you it was a metallic, a metallic clamor, a metallic surface. I knew immediately, forget about your investigation method. You will not get one single molecule from the granite wall in this afternoon or this midnight. Um, I told the inspector, listen, we want to investigate this. He made a turn, has spoken a little bit with, uh, in Arabic with our tour operator, and then he left the room. He said, I will be back in 50 minutes, bring a little bit water. And this was quite nice because the temperature and the moisture was very high. It was not very comfortable. Um, in accordance to our original plan to solve with cotton pads and alcoholic liquid, the substance from the wall, we uh, estimated we will need per sample about 10 to 15 minutes. Then we wanted to shift the letter and test another black area, as we call it, black tongues. But when I saw these black areas in my first time, as a first times in my life, very close, as a 10, 15 centimeters away, I have to come back to my investigations, what I, what I do to, uh, at the moment. Uh, with several international institutions with this antique written records, I know very well from my former education that what we have discovered there is well written in ancient textbooks. I'm speak about Thales von Milet, I'm speak about Aratosthenes, uh, Aristoteles, I'm speak about Pliny, as a Plinius the older, the old one. This antique scholars had a clear knowledge of how the ancient Egyptians made their pyramids. Well, and don't don't leave us hanging here. What 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 was it? They obviously it's been talked about. Uh, what, what what did you see? And what I have to quote is the most experienced antique scholar, in my opinion, is Herodot. Herodotus yes. has carefully, uh, as he lived over several years, I think eight years in Egypt. He traveled through the country uh, in the fifth century before Christ, uh, from from Alexandria till the first cataract. He and we have to also this. You cannot understand what I found there without having this knowledge about the Greeks in Egypt. Since Ramses II, per year, we, we have just raw estimations by the historians. At least one thousand Greek experts have been studied in Egypt since 1200 before Christ. They studied in Heliopolis, in Memphis, and I just want to mention few very well-known uh, Greek cosmographers. I'm speaking about Pythagoras, I'm speaking about yeah, Herodot, I'm speaking about um, Solon, this famous uh, scholar from Greece, uh, from Greek, who even made the uh, very important uh, statements of the Greek societies in the fourth century before Christ. This was not a coincidence. These people were accompanied by the by well-educated price in this time. And that is why the modern critics on Herodot and that what he has reported about the making of the pyramids is mainly wrong, cannot be true because Herodot was not a modern tourist who has paid some Egyptian tourist guy some bakshish. He was in the hand of the best educated Egyptian in the times. And this we have to acknowledge, this we have to percept when we are speaking what Herodot has reported to us. Well, well tell us, how, what did he say or how the Egyptians built the pyramids? And I would say the most three information are following. First of all, the Egyptian pyramids were made step by step. Definitely not by using ramps, ramp point. That makes that makes Second, a lot of sense. Huh? I was gonna say that that actually makes a lot of sense. That's always kind of what I've thought they would have had but to do it step by step. This is what modern Egyptology is refusing, by the way. Second very important information from Herodot is they lifted the stones with large wooden machines. Hmm. Wooden machines. Also, he, he is not uh, in detail what 
are these machines, he just calls them machines. But we know by other uh, records, at these times, the Greeks had a clear knowledge what, a mach- what the meaning of a machine is. It's a technical instrument to increase man's power, to increase man's ability to do some things. Right. Let's say one machine is also a ship is a machine, if you say it, if you cut it down to the rough meaning. Yeah, you can't and debate the definition. Yeah. And the third information is even more remarkable. He says, why is it Great pyramids are so perfectly made in stone, in measurements, in orientation. They used iron as a construction material. And this is maybe the, the major critics of Herodot in modern times that modern, exper- uh, modern Egyptologists say, listen, this guy was an Egyptian lover, an Egyptian admired person. He invented some certain things to increase the importance of his reports. And that is why the majority of modern Egyptologists, or let's say scientists, refuse to the information what we got transferred by Herodot from the time 500 BC. And this is what what is, that's why I said, that's why it's so important not to have a special hypothesis because you are narrow-minding your perception. That's why I was totally open. Just let's have a look and let's see what we will find there. And that's and that's what any good scientist, you know, I guess what a good scientist does. I I now I definitely can understand that. You don't want to go in really with with any biases and uh, that I can completely understand that perspective. So knowing that history, did what you find this metallic surface as you described it uh, did that prove what Herodotus was saying, or something? Did it say something else, or is there even let a relationship? Us, let us again step back because actually, I, I, <laughs> uh, again, I have to a little bit, a little bit more phil- philosophic what I'm saying, because important for your radio listener is to understand what the meaning of modern science is. Many people expect from a modern scientist he has to answer the ultimate question about the nature of this or this or this, but this is completely wrong. Real science never delivers the ultimate truth. Being frank, the ultimate truth even does not exist outside. Modern uh, new science only delivers deeper questions. And this is what I did also with my Abora uh, experiments, because when I started my first experiments, all experts in ship history, Egyptology predicted me it's impossible to tack with an ancient Stone Age designed raft against the wind. What was even impossible for to hire done. But Schopenhauer said in, in, the last, uh, in the last century, doubt is the beginning of the knowledge, doubt is the beginning of wisdom. And this is what I transferred also inside of the pyramid. I do never trust anything what is written in books or what somebody somebody is telling me except the ancients because this is what I could learn from my idol to Hayadan. He always trusted in the intelligence of the antique societies. That is why he was in the end successful with Kotiki, Ra, Tigris, whatever he did. And this is when I climbed second times up to this black areas and again, I investigated with my eyes and hands, with my natural senses, this black patina. I have to say, this is definitely outstanding what we discovered there, because I knew immediately what I have discovered and discovered in this moment was perfectly in accordance to what Herodot has mentioned in this old, in, in his second book of. Uh, history of Egypt, as I'm speaking about Ireland. So was the metallic uh, material, maybe you just don't want to say and give it away just yet, uh, but was it, if he said it was iron, was that metallic surface uh, have iron as part of its origin or uh, part of its material? Yeah, um, when you go back to ancient uh, scholars like Thales from Milet or Pliny, the old one, mm-hmm. yes, they, they, degree, call right. it, uh, they call it not iron, they call it magnes, also in modern language magnetite. 
Huh. And it's well described by many Greek uh, so-called scholars. Said he called it um, a black. Or let, let, let me Google one word again. Oh, uh, please. Black, black, black class brilliance. Black real, uh, black luster. It's um, it looks very dark, grey, metallic, mm -hmm. and this is well uh, described by antique authors like Thales or Pliny or others as a black madness glimmer or black shine. Yeah, shine is the best word. Black dark shine. And even uh, in modern times, uh, so when I'm speaking about Flintness Petrie, and we still have to speak about him, modern, as uh, from the new age Egyptologist, he have c completely confirmed what I'm saying about this. Uh, in earlier periods, yes, this black shine was well known in the antique time, and the people knew exactly what what the meaning is. It's a special kind of iron oxide, what we call today magnetite. It's a special kind of iron, and yes, at this time I had no idea what. Also, I I I believed, or my my hypothesis in this moment was, I changed it from a black organic nature definitely to a metallic substance which came somehow somewhere on the ceiling because it was not sure if it's modern maybe the English colonizers put something on the ceiling maybe maybe whatever it could be that's why I always try to be open as long as possible and not to say what the result of our investigation is but, but to cut a long story short that was the reason why I changed the investigation method from this cotton pads to a little sigil with a little hammer and we took tiny again tiny 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 milligram from this black patina and when we delivered this uh, samples to the institution uh -huh. I, asked, I asked them two times please take a balance and have a measurement of the weight of the substances and they said Dominic, you are kidding me, it's impossible to wait, it's too little. There is no balance in the world who can measure what you collected there. It's too little, even to wait. Uh, to wait. Also, everything together was not more as a few crystals of salt to have a picture for the listeners. As it is, the institution refused to make a measurement of the weight because it was such a little amount of substance. We, in, we estimated something between 50 to 150 milligrams. Not even one gram, not a half of a gram. Wow. Dust, stardust. Also, I, because I never wanted to harm this building. It yeah. was just to get a tiny little bit substance because being a uh, natural scientist and you Modern science does not need kilograms of a material to investigate. Yeah, you, so you took the smallest amount possible. Yeah, you took the smallest amount possible because you yourself have great love for the pyramid and respect for it. You don't want to harm it, uh, and you're only going to take the enough to to you know have a a, si a sample size to actually to legitimately test. So, and it sounds like what you took probably wasn't even noticeable. Yeah, as a, one cough and say. In the, on the class, everything is disappeared. So it's a, such a little amount. That's why I have to say sorry for all Egyptians. We never wanted to harm the Egyptian antiquity. Sorry for the stress what we finally caused with our operation. This was never in our motivation. We never we wanted we never wanted to become famous. What I am now, badly famous. As in and, and like you said before, you you're still at that time under the impression that you had complete. A permit and were allowed to do and conduct this type of scientific research. Also, later when we come to the scandal, now we don't have the scandal. Because right, we're not, and we're not even on the part where the charges are really against you. This, this is not even, I guess, technically the, the controversial part of it. <laughs> <laughs> it still comes. <laughs> this was for us. We were perfect in 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 in, in harmony with the inspectors. They were not always inside, but for me, I had no concern because when the two inspectors went out to bring water, we still expected to work over two hours with these cotton pads because one solution should take at least 10 minutes to give the alcoholic liquid enough time 
to solve this material out of the stone. That is why when the inspector said, we come back in 10, 15 minutes, I said, yes, go, okay. <laughs> because I still expected to have my hands on the ceiling with a small cotton pad just to wait 10 minutes until the alcoholic liquid has done its operation. Yes, you finally did I made it. these discoveries after these two inspectors went out and when I again climbed up to the ladder, I said, you are kidding me? I cannot do anything with alcohol and metal. Uh, yeah, because what is this completely different than what what you were expecting, uh, as as exactly. we said before, and, exactly. and just a minute ago you said you know you you had the samples you gave it away for testing. Uh, did what what did the analysis say uh, when you got of the black marking back? Because we we still have another part to talk about too. Uh, what did the black markings? What what did the analysis say about that? You cannot imagine how much evening lasting discussions we had in the institution because facing such imp impossible evidence was not expected by me, by Stefan Erdmann and also by the uh, serving scientists what we had used in back in Germany. And based on the fact that it cannot be what can be, both scientists tried to search alternative explanations. Maybe Magnetic bacteria have solved out of the granite stone this metallic pattern and it was sometimes a little bit uh, funny yeah. to, to discuss with these guys because, what shall I say, of course it is hard to believe facing the impossible and this is what I learned in former times by my experiment, uh, Abora exp uh, experiments that it's just a normal behavior of modern 21st century living uh, human beings, it's hard to understand what we found there. That is why it took us over three months to find an agreement to continue in, in the investigations because at first of all, we, we measured the first iron signals. But this was not very surprisingly because as you maybe know, iron is one of the minerals also in natural granite. So it might be possible that we have detected iron of the natural granite. So it took us about two months to discuss how can we explain this and what could be the alternative explanation not to go deeper, trick and talk, up and down. It has lasted for weeks to bring them to the black area. Then we detected that the, this black area is covered by a quite thick uh, population of fungi and bacteria. This has convinced again one of the scientists which was in charge, yes, these black areas are caused by the metabolism of these bacteria. But I told him, I am the biologist, you are the chemist. I can I can swear, I can tell you, magnetic bacteria live under an oxygen-free atmosphere. But we have oxygen in the chamber. Even before it was blocked, we have these air shafts. And, and it's for sure that it couldn't happen due to the metabolism of these bacteria because the shape, the size of these black areas is 18 times almost identical. It's 18 times in the same nature. This cannot be the effect of a biological interactions of the bacteria and the stone. If so, you would have everywhere this black area, but not on those few places, what I have described before. Uh, absolutely stunning. I mean, this is this is a quite quite the revelation uh, that that you're talking about, uh, and it's uh, kind of hard to, to wrap your head around, quite frankly. <laughs> uh, but this is what the meaning of modern science should be: open-minded thinking in 360 degrees direction. And this is what we did together as one team in our university city. So, so and then we decided, okay, let's clean with a high plasma beam this bacteria and fungi away. And we measured again, and this was nice, it was first uh, success, uh, yes, success for the interdisciplinary attempts to come closer and closer to the real nature of this black patina. And so finally, we could see in the uh, electron microscope after this, it's called sputter, as to make it free with a high energy beam. We clean the areas, to make it not to measure anything organic in between 
Do you understand me? Oh yes. And after after these operations, when we got the confirmation, this was in August 2013. About we we could prove now we have the cleaned surface, and again we detected iron and oxygen. But this was not enough because this could be also iron oxide, whatever the meaning is. And so we decided we have to go deeper to the chemical nature of this uh, patina, and then the institution decided okay we have to use a completely new uh, investigation method it's called xps analysis and with this analysis xps i hope it's well pronounced in english we could not only see the elements we could also see the chemical um, components the, the makeup of it yeah what is what is in nature the real chemical nature and after a few weeks of investigation, we got in at the end of August, somewhere 2013, the final result magnetite, and this is the strongest iron oxide wow. at all. But for, at this moment, we had no idea about the origin and what could be the meaning of this patina. We just had the pattern, the chemical stamp. This is what I saw with my eyes in April. Now I became the modern. 21st century technical evidence, yes, wow. my initial hypothesis was right, it was not what I believed in the very first beginning when we started.